Yeah, isn't that cool? That's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, you can totally hear the chickens. It's pretty radical. All right. We're going to check our connection and then go live here. So we are on Nexus here. So we're going to be looking at two cameras. Hi. <laughs> um, you all know how this goes. We're looking at two cameras. We have the Instagram live camera here. And then we have the Nexus camera here as well. So we're going to try and bounce in between the two of these. Um, but we're totally stoked to answer all of your questions regarding um, entomology. So tonight on Evenings of Enology, we're going to be talking about bugs. <laughs> and I, I asked Alex how many times I could talk about bugs and make a bug pun. And she said as many as I wanted. So I'm going to make all, all the bugs. I'm going to make all <laughs> the bug puns. Um, let's let our Wi-Fi here connect. There we go. Hey, uh, so my name is Kayleen. I am the Psy community like token enologist. And I'm Alex Whitener. I am an entomologist. And today we're going to be talking about bugs yeah. and, and the role. Can you scoot a little closer? Oh, yeah. There we go. We're going to be talking about um, entomology and its role in viticulture. There's a really tight association between pests, pest management, and then um, viticulture enology as well. So I am stoked. <laughs> um, also, a little bit of background. I went to high school with Alex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're actually friends from a long time ago. Um, and Alex now lives in Washington state and I live in California. And so she's down here for work and she decided to come hang out with us. So um, I guess without further ado, we can get started on our, on our little interview about books. <laughs> so uh, Alex, can you first uh, tell the audience who you are and where you're from, and what your education is? Yeah. So I'm Alex Whitener. Um, I grew up in Wenatchee. Like Keelene said, we went to school together. Uh, after high school, I went to Western Washington University and I earned my bachelor's in uh, biology, anthropology, and I got a minor in women's studies. Um, and I originally thought I was going to go into the healthcare uh, field, but I had been working for an entomologist all throughout my undergrad. And so I had been going back every summer and working seasonally uh, in entomology. And I thought that I really liked it. Uh, it was really cool to show up at oh, the hey, lab. Oh, same and, major, by the way. Oh, hey, look at that. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you never know what you can do with that. It's so cool that all of these different fields are so interdisciplinary. Yeah, totally. And I totally use stuff from, from anthropology in my entomology studies. I did in my PhD and I do as a professional entomologist. Um, awesome. Yeah. So I, I originally thought I was going to healthcare and uh, realized that all the research that I was doing in the summer was super important. It was reaching a lot of growers. I really liked the applied aspect of it. And I had this big mystery of, okay, I collected all this data and then I went back to school and what the heck happened with it? <laughs> um, and so when I, when I asked that to my, my boss at the time and then she became my PhD advisor. She said, I, I think you need to look into research and see if there's something here. And there definitely was something there and there still is. Uh, so then I applied for um, the entomology program at Washington State University. I was given the opportunity to skip my master's, which I'm very grateful that I was given that opportunity. Yeah, it's expensive um, to do a master's. Absolutely, yeah. And so I feel like I'm saving a little bit of time um, maybe, maybe not. You never know how long those projects are going to last. That's true. Good point. Um, but yeah, so then I, I went through my, my PhD program at Washington State University, and I had kind of a unique experience there. I spent uh, my coursework on the main campus, and Washington State University is a land-grant university. Um, that means, what does that mean? That means, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> um, so that means that there are these agricultural ties um, with, the, with the community and with each state. So every state cool. has a land-grant school and um, this other public state school. Um, and then the other part of uh, the land-grant school system is there are also extension centers in every single county of every state. Okay. And those extension centers can either work in, closely with agriculture as an agricultural research station. Go Cougs! Um, yeah, go Cougs! <gasps> I have to say I was a little bit more patriotic during my undergrad. Um, but <laughs> yeah, go Cougs. They had an awesome football game not too long ago, I heard. I, th um, I heard there was sports ball and it right? was like really yeah, and they and they footballed really hard. They footballed harder, so hard. Better than the other ones, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... Um, I can't remember where I was going with that. Oh, a land grant school is an extension center. So I got to spend all of my research time uh, at an extension center. And uh, that was where I got to interact uh, firsthand with growers and actually 
I mean, it, when you're on the main campus, you still have some ties uh, with with stakeholders and with uh, with research, and you do see your research take fruition and be used in the field. Um, but I am really grateful for the opportunity that I had to work firsthand with growers uh, all all year around, which was fantastic. Awesome, uh, and it really shaped where I am today with entomology. So what is your current role in the industry of entomology? What do you do for work? Right yeah, now? so uh, I was lucky enough to get a, a job out of out of school and uh, I got my first choice, which was great. I contract research. Uh, I didn't want to give up my ties with extension. So I get to contract research with extension entomologists um, as well as plant pathologists and weed scientists. I'm not just an entomologist anymore. And um, do you mean weed like... Weeds oh are god, like weeds yeah, like actual like high weeds. as a kite. Yeah. Um yeah, we don't get to go there yet. Um, but hey, that's a growing industry and it there's is a growing industry. definitely some needs there in terms of pest management. Yeah. Um <laughs> totally. yeah, so so I do a lot with weed management in terms of uh, weeds that are growing uh, in vineyards or in hop yards or in tree fruit and things like that. So okay. I primarily work with specialty crops, which um there's no better place for me. I, I love specialty crops. Um, but I get to work with extension personnel, people who were on my PhD committee, my former advisor. I have an experiment contracted mm -hmm. with her. That's so cool, dude. Yeah, it's very exciting yeah. to be able to work with your advisor in, a, in an additional professional setting. In a collaborative setting. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's very cool. And I, I'm learning stuff from her. And uh, yeah, it's great. It just never ends. Sweet. So I also get to conduct some of my own experiments. I haven't gotten a chance to do that this year because it's been a very, um, a very new year for me. I'm still learning a lot. Um, it never stops. But I also get to provide technical support, which means I get to interact with growers, interact with um, people who are uh, also interacting with growers, so other consultants and things like that. And I get to talk about certain products that this private company sells. Um, those are uh, insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. But we also get to look at an integrated approach on how those can be judiciously used. Cool. So, by the way, hello from Connecticut. <laughs> Hi from California. Um, today we're going to talk a lot about, so this is the evenings of enology, and so we talk about um, things regarding enology or the science of wine. And I think one of the things that people don't realize is that there was this nasty, I'll, I'll call it a bug and you can explain sure. later, <laughs> um, a nasty bug called phylloxera. Um, and phylloxera almost wiped out essentially the entire global wine industry in the early 20th century. And what it does, and Alex is going to talk more about this in just a few minutes, is it it screws up your rootstock essentially. <laughs> and so you have parts of a vine, and you have you have a rootstock of a vine, you have the body of a vine, and then you have some connection of cordons and canes, and those are things that grapes grow off of. Um, and what phylloxera does is it basically gets into your roots and totally screws with you, um, and it can spread via flooding which is how a lot of it spread through France and to Germany and to other areas. Um, and it can spread just through just proximity essentially. And so not only was it a huge issue in France and in Germany for the wine industry and devastated almost 70% of crops in France and Germany in the early 20th century, it also devastated a lot of California and for like historical relevance of phylloxera as well. It also coincided with, um, the end of the depression and it also coincided with prohibition and so the wine industry was jacked for a while there in the 20th century and there were actually more vineyards and more acres planted to vines than like plums or figs or anything before the 1900s and there were in 1960s so 1890 there was actually more land planted to grapes than there were anything else versus 1960, which is insane. Yeah, there are so, priorities in order. <laughs> <laughs> priorities in order, yeah. Uh, but all, the, all that is to say is that this thing called phylloxera is incredibly important in the wine industry. And so we're going to talk a lot about it today. So Alex, what is phylloxera? Yeah. So phylloxera sort of looks like an aphid, but it's not an aphid. It's in a completely different uh, family of its own, uh, phylloxeridae. Uh, it, it's also sometimes called a root louse or a plant louse. Uh, it's not the type of louse that you would find. What is a uh, louse? Yeah, so an, an actual formal louse is a completely different family. That's that's a, a parasite that you find on mammals and, and some other animals as well. But uh, this is basically the plant version of a louse. So um, what 
Phylloxera due to plants, uh, particularly grapes, uh, they'll attack the root system and uh, prevent that grape from propagating properly and having as much vigor as it should. Um, but also the nymphal stages will attack the leaves and cause galls. What are galls? So a gall is sort of, if you go back to this sort of humanoid um, type of example, if you were to get <laughs> bit by some sort of insect, your body would say, hey, I don't like that and it might cause a bump, you have this histamine response. Basically a gall is the plant version of that. And so it's an immune response uh, in response to herbivory. And I think a lot of us think about herbivory as um, maybe like a caterpillar actually removing foliage and, and ingesting it. And herbivory goes a lot farther than that. You can have insects that feed on roots. You can have insects that insert, insert a stylet into the plant and suck the juices out. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to feed on plants. And phylloxera um, does a great job on roots, a great job or bad job, uh, depending, on, your depending on how you want to <laughs> yeah. look at it. Um, but roots and then, and then it can also cause that galling on leaves. So what, it, what exactly is its mode of damage then? Oh, and, um, and sorry, by the way, I know I say this every week, um, but this is the zone of no judgment and you yeah. can feel free to bug us with any questions that you, I asked. I asked how many times I could say bug in this and she said as many as you want. So I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Um, but feel free to ask us any questions. This is very like interactive and we are totally stoked to try and answer all of your questions. And I might know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Let's we'll talk about mites This later. is the best pun <laughs> oh, live that's session. That's kind of why I wanted to be an entomologist. There are so, <laughs> so many, many pun opportunities. It's great. <laughs> uh, so what is phylloxera's mode of damage then? Um, so when they're feeding on the roots, um, they're actually removing root tissue and that leaves the plant susceptible to uh, sooty black rot, other pathogens. Um, it also- What, is that? what did you just say? Oh, sooty black rot. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure if it's a bacteria or if it's a fungus, but mm -hmm. it is a pathogen that can cause further damage. It's a secondary infection. So while phylloxera doesn't actually um, act as a vector, I have to be very careful. Vector is not a verb. I've been told that. Um, so they, they do not act as a vector uh, for diseases, but you can have these secondary infections that sort of take advantage of the situation that phylloxera has created on the plant. Okay. Uh, and so that type of damage will also prevent the plant from thriving. Um, it basically has to spend all of this energy fighting off um, this herbivore that's feeding on it instead of uh, allocating those resources towards growth or reproduction, which is how we get grapes. Um, right. and, and so that inhibits what we want out of grapes, which is a high yield and a very high quality crop. Right. So why then was it so devastating for Vitis vinifera? Vitis vinifera being the genus and species that we typically associate with wine grapes. Yeah, so when we look at um, uh, resistant rootstocks of what would prevent that, um, we don't really know a whole lot about the actual mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to why it was so devastating, uh, and this is um, potentially true of grapes, uh, it's more of something we don't really fully understand, but it's very true in a lot of other agricultural systems. When you start um, breeding a plant or um, uh, refining it for actual consumption, we we don't want to eat wild apples. They, they don't taste good. They actually good. kind of taste like shit. Yeah, and the texture a lot of is seeds. garbage. Yeah. yeah, so if you look at that, <laughs> you look at these different types of fruits and vegetables as models, they tend, these, these wild types that tend to fight off pests better um, if you count us as a pest, that works too because we're totally a pest. Yeah. Humans are the worst. <laughs> we eat stuff. <laughs> Humans so suck. <laughs> they'll be heavy with seeds. They won't taste as good. And so when we start to refine them to the point where we actually want to consume them, um, they tend to lose those protective properties um, because some of those protective properties are what prevent us from wanting to eat them. So like right. the production of, of different types of like auxins and, and other sorts of, of chemicals. Totally. Um, and so when, when we get there, things become more susceptible. So we're gonna transition. Um, we've mentioned this word rootstock a lot and that's because it's really important in phylloxera because it does attack the rootstock. Um, but there's a cool story that Alex is gonna tell regarding rootstocks and how phylloxera can affect rootstocks. But we first need to define a rootstock which we kind of did a hot second ago, but I'm just gonna reiterate. So, um, Rootstocks can vary widely. And oftentimes in winemaking, you'll hear the term grafting. So you will graft something onto a rootstock. And so you'll pick your rootstock based on whatever pressure it is that your vineyard is experiencing. And so um, let, let, let's say I know that I'm in an area, this is very unlikely nowadays. Let's say that I know I'm in an area where I have phylloxera. 
or I could have phylloxera. I'm going to pick a rootstock, so a base that can get nutrients from the ground that is going to be resistant to phylloxera. You can also have rootstocks for other issues as well. And you can graft whatever the hell you want on it as far as grapes are concerned. So I can take an American rootstock that's going to typically make like Concord grapes. So when you think of like Concord grapes and the grapes by the store, they're Vitis riparis. It's a totally different species. Um, but let's say I wanted to take that rootstock and put some freaking fancy and French on it, right? So I could totally do that. I could totally take that rootstock, put it into the ground, and then just graft on Grenache or Pinot Noir or Chardonnay or whatever it is that I want. And so when we think about phylloxera and the wine industry and pest management, it's important to understand that rootstocks are a really huge deal. Um, and so we need to understand that a rootstock is only a part of the grape and that you can swap that around almost like Legos. You can like wine Legos. Totally. It absolutely is wine Legos. Yeah. yeah. And I really like what you brought up earlier about uh, bringing up nutrients. So rootstock is the base. The, that's your the thing that's in the ground and that is your first building block. It's your first Lego. Right. It's your first Lego. And, <laughs> and those those nutrients are really important. And when great phylloxera feeds on roots, the roots can't do their job as well. Correct. Um, and so having a really strong base or a strong rootstock, and this is true in a lot of other aspects too, um, the specialty crop market in terms of tree fruit. Uh, we also use grafting in, in apples. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we have a rootstock, and that, that here's where rootstock comes in. They're not growing the fruit. And so Correct. you can have a rootstock of something that grows really crummy fruit. And it doesn't matter because you're you're grafting the part that, that is creating or making you're the You're grafting fruit. the moneymaker. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so you can have this really strong, hearty vessel that grows fruit that nobody wants to eat. Um, but when you graft something on top of it, then you're getting your actual edible product. Right. Um, and so when it comes to rootstocks, uh, selecting a rootstock that's best for um, or that's the best fit for the environment that a grower has. So... That's when we look at things like soils um, and that's where the integrated part comes in. Integrated pest management is making these decisions um, from the ground up to prevent pest literally. damage. Totally. Yeah. yeah. From the ground up. Yeah. Quite literally. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that further down the road, you have set yourself up for success to not have to put as many inputs in terms of pest management later. Exactly. Um, and rootstocks can also play a role too in, in, the buffer capacity of a soil, mm -hmm. like all, all kinds of stuff. Rootstocks are yeah. fascinating. Water use efficiency. Uh, yep. There are some rootstocks uh, that use water more efficiently. Yep. Uh, water irrigation is a huge issue with grapes in terms of, there, there's a lot of science behind it in terms of what you're doing to your plants uh, with water. But then also looking at the types of soil that you have. So phylloxera really likes these um sort of hard packed clay soils. They don't like sandy soils. They don't like soils that have a lot right. of spaces in them or that, that do have, they like the ones that have a lot of spaces in them. That's how they move around. But if you have a- um, Which is unfortunate because those are typically yeah. called well draining soils. Which is- And oftentimes in the want. wine industry, you want soils that yeah. drain really well because you actually, it's counterintuitive, but when you're growing up grapes for viticulture, for winemaking, you actually want your grapes to be starved. Yeah. So it's better for them if they actually have to have a really hard time getting access to water. Yeah. So the same envir environment that makes a grapevine starve is also gonna like create an environment for phylloxera to thrive. So if you're trying to make good wine, you're trying to make a really kind of honestly a shitty environment, <laughs> that shitty environment is actually really great for phylloxera. And that's the thing about agriculture. There are all these pluses and minuses, all these pros and cons, and, and there's no perfect uh, formula. And so when we start talking about integrated pest management, there's no perfect formula for IPM. It's something that's very dynamic. Uh, you have to make choices and sacrifices um, in certain areas for the greater good of what you're producing. Um, and so when it comes totally. to rootstocks, we have rootstocks that are more resistant to nematodes. We have rootstocks that are more resistant to phylloxera. Those might not be the same rootstocks. And so if you have heavy nematode pressure and maybe your phylloxera aren't gonna show up or, or they show up in low enough numbers, it's really not that big of a deal once your vineyard establishes those more mature uh, vines are going to be much more resilient. Um, and so that might be something that you take into consideration. Totally. All right. So let's tell the story of C.V. Riley. We're going to have story time. <laughs> yeah. Hope you grab a glass of wine or if you're in Australia, a mimosa <laughs> or whatever it is that you're drinking. I don't really, I'm, you do you. Um, but let's tell the story of C.V. Riley because it's actually pretty cool. Yeah. So I'm, again, I'm an entomologist. So I have sort of an entomological bias on this. Um, there are other people involved, such as plant pathologists and, and geneticists involved in this story. Um, but for the most part, um, when the, what I like to call the 
uh, the plague of the grape industry because that's what it was to France. They lost two thirds of their uh, of their grapes uh, due to grape phylloxera. But when that happened, uh, C. V. Riley, who's an entomologist, who noticed that these American rootstocks were resistant to grape phylloxera. And again, we talked about how rootstocks were sort of that base that you can build upon uh, in your system. And so when when he noticed that that resistance. Um, they were able to uh, bring that over to France and essentially save the grape industry um, with seriously save the grape industry quite literally. And this was such a unique um, event in entomological history because when you think of uh, uh, pest management, um, and it, when we get into IPM and talking about how to decrease your inputs in terms of chemical inputs, so in terms of pesticides. Phylloxera is an example where there really weren't any chemical options. When we get these new invasive species, sometimes those are our only tools in our toolbox, our, our chemicals. And so when we look at these integrated approaches that include biological control, cultural control, here was this genetic option that essentially solved that the problem. That is pretty problem. freaking cool. Yeah, it's yeah. very rare. This does not happen every day. <laughs> yeah. So someone on Nexus actually just asked, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to pronounce this name wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, Circe? Circe? Yeah, Circe Verba, yeah. maybe, potentially. I'm sorry. Please correct me. I don't want to slaughter your name. Um, she asked, can you talk about your analytical methods for looking at the impacts of pests? I love this question. This is <laughs> such a cool question. We were talking earlier um, during my introduction about the interdisciplinary opportunities between different uh, types of fields. So um, if you're a scientist, you're going to have to be um, you're, you're going to have to be, uh, what am I trying to think of the word for? What Sorry, I don't doing? know. I'm like, I'm like, mm, the nose ah. is so lovely. <laughs> yeah. um, you, why can't I think of that word? When you do your actual analysis approaches. on your data, you are a analyst. I don't know. Uh, a scientist, a nerd. You're analyzing uh, your data. You have to do statistics. You're a statistician. Um, that's one sort of field that you have to be in. But when we think of the economic impact of insects on, um, on the economy, you have to be an economist too. And so we'll have agroeconomists come in and do um, an analysis on the impact of a pest. So I have a perfect example for you. There's a new invasive species, it's not really new anymore, um, but it was what I did my PhD on. So spotted wing drosophila, when it first arrived to the United States, it was like, oh my gosh, 80% damage to untreated cherries and berries and other crops. 80%? 80%. Holy shit snacks. That's a buttload of money. And so you yeah. bring in an agroeconomist when you're when you're working on those control methods, which is very um, uh, applied science in terms of what can growers actually bring to the field. What are those? Yeah, I like that multimodal yeah. techniques. Yeah, multimodal yeah, techniques. Totally. Yeah, totally. So so we'll combine forces with a statistician. We'll combine forces with an economic um, person, so an agroeconomist, somebody who um, actually looks at what 80% means economically. And here's the other part. It's not so much just, oh, that crop was damaged so you can't sell it. It's also, I'm having as a grower to Sorry. put in, <laughs> you're good. I'm having as a grower to put in so many more inputs to actually control this pest. I'm worried about labor. I'm worried about risk. And I don't have a lot of time. If I'm a grower, those are my three main concerns. Yeah, totally. And if I have some some idea of, okay, if I put this amount of inputs in and I'm going to be able to actually sell you know, more than 20% of my crop, which ideally you would sell a lot more than that. Um, but those, those are really important. And so what we do is we look at the phenology of the pest, how long it's living, um, those dynamics. So what techniques do you use to ask those questions? Yeah, so trapping and monitoring is important because you get to see how far that pest is spread. If it's spread in an area where grapes, I'm digressing from the SWD example, but um, when you're looking at where grapes actually occur, you might look at um, ArcGIS. You might what say ArcGIS, um, it's a mapping system that helps you look at different types of landscapes. Oh, cool. And okay. you can lay these different <laughs> layers um, over it that show where grapes are or where apples are. And if you plot all of your different traps that you have, you have these sentinel traps that you put out these sentinel traps are used with these uh, invasive species when we don't really know where they've spread to. Okay. And you lay that over your map and you look at where they overlap. And if you're catching spotted wing drosophila in a place where that 
uh, crop doesn't exist or, or X pest with uh, Y crop doesn't exist, then that goes into your analysis. Um, I'm, I'm not personally a modeler and I'm not an agroeconomist, um, but there are some really powerful modeling tools um, that can sort of forecast uh, what damage um, will occur where. And I know with, with uh, some pests in particular, modeling can uh, take place in um, climate forecasts of looking, well, where can this pest actually occur? And that's where you look at these different um, uh, environmental factors of, okay, this pest really likes moist soils, or this pest really likes um, a dry, arid climate. And you start to look at this, this model that uh, has all these different dimensions and look at where it can actually be, and then look at, you know, certain pests don't just attack one crop. And right. that's what makes uh, certain pests much more problematic. If you have an insect that is um, polylectic, it likes a lot of different kinds of crops. It has a lot of different places to go. If you right. are controlling it in this crop, but it has this area of refugia, it's going to seek that out, multiply, and then it's going to be a problem again the next year or maybe in a different crop or in a different area. Totally. So it's it's a pretty dynamic a dynamic system. That was a really great question. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of different opportunities. Thank you, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Ask any questions. I say it all the time, but this is the zone of no judgment. There is no bad question. There's only a question you didn't ask and questions make this super fun. And we, we love chatting with y'all. This is the best. This is the best. This is the best way to spend a Friday night. Seriously. It's super fun. It's I'm super, really excited. It's, super, <laughs> it's great. Um, so with the advent of using American rootstock and grafting Bittus vinifera onto it to produce grapes that are resistant, resistant to phylloxera. It's not really an issue anymore, but um, if it were to become an issue, how could people navigate handling phylloxera in current vineyards? And is there a conventional versus organic way to do that? And how and how can viticulture managers kind of handle that issue in modern times? Yeah. So so first of all, the, the rootstocks, the resistant rootstocks, that is um, across the board, uh, organic, conventional, yep. um, if you want to say like low impact or all these different other like biodynamic orchard, or orchards or vineyards or hop yards or what have you. Um, so, so that was sort of the silver bullet for phylloxera, but it still does flare up in some cases. And who knows, maybe that rootstock um, that you chose because your area wasn't originally 30 years ago, 50 years ago, susceptible to phylloxera, things change. Yeah. Um, pests can adapt and, and, and find new places. And so um, maybe you're By looking the way, for- By the way, seriously, I was really stoked on your GIS oh, cool. comment. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. ArcGIS is super rad. Yeah. I wish that I had gotten to use it more in my, in my PhD work. Um, I see a lot of potential for it um, in my work now. And so I'm, I'm still learning how to use ArcGIS. I think it's a really yeah. great tool. Um, but so when we look at, um, Hey Patrick, by the way, <laughs> hi, <laughs> when we look at, uh, other options, uh, things that people might use now, um, there are some, uh, well, first of all, let's just lay this out on the table. Uh, there are no chemical control options really for phylloxera. We can't penetrate into the soil to actually reach the pest. Um, and it's just not feasible in that aspect. And so again, this is a very unique system. Um, so, so crazy, dude. It really is. And so, I've never so, thought about that. Yeah, it's just that it, bug is so smart, unique. dude. You don't <laughs> so, um, shit. when we look at the <laughs> other things that we can do for phylloxera, um, it, it sort of starts again. Here's the pun again from the ground up. So, mm -hmm. when you're looking at pre plant, you're looking at the soils that you have. Is there already root material in, in the soil that you need to maybe let go fallow for a while so that anything in there dies? That's a very long, uh, it takes a long time. It's very expensive to let a, a field that could be. What time frame are we looking at? You know, that's actually a question I'm not sure, but it is okay. years, it, it, multiple years. Uh, it would take a while. Root, root material can live for, for quite a while. Um, there are some other diseases and other plants. Uh, if you look at cherries with a little cherry virus and that root material, again, years, like five plus. Yeah. And, and again, five years worth of time that you could be putting in a new vineyard or a new orchard and spending that time building that crop up uh, versus um, maybe leaving something in and hopefully producing. Like, this is where that agroeconomic um, sort of analysis comes in of when, when is it worth redoing? And so when you look at, um, at your soil in the beginning and looking at the types of soil that you have, if you can set it up better uh, in terms of 
preventing phylloxera from getting the upper hand when you plant. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of it. The other part of it is being very selective of your rootstock, of course. Right. Um, but there are some other integrated approaches too. Um, and this can be after your vineyard has, has already established. If you know that another vineyard has great phylloxera, and again, those resistant rootstocks get phylloxera. better neighbors. Let's well, start there. first of all, get better neighbors. Uh, <laughs> second of all, don't share your equipment. Yes, um, that's a yes. huge uh, that has a huge impact on the spread of pests. And uh, so, making sure that you're using clean equipment that you know uh, isn't dragging root material in or dragging um, anything that could have any sort of uh, any. Basically, that that tractor is a is a vector, or that that truck that right. you're hauling through could be yeah. a, could be a potential vector. And that's actually, I mean, Alex and I. This is really this is actually really rad to do because we come from very different backgrounds. Yeah. <laughs> um, and from a practical perspective, at a winery, you're sharing a lot of shit. Yeah, there's, there's it's like expensive. A, there's a joke in the wine industry of like, in order to make a small profit in the in the wine industry, you must first start with a large one because it's a very expensive industry. Absolutely. And we're constantly sharing shit like. If a forklift goes down, you better hope your neighbor has a forklift. It, you're oftentimes sharing the same press because presses are tens of thousands of dollars. And yeah. so um, you, very frequently in, in the industry, you're sharing a bunch of equipment. And if you're not a nice neighbor and you're like, oh, I'm a phylloxera, but I really need to use your press because yeah. my grapes well, are coming in. They have and phylloxera. Yeah. Like, yeah. Do I really need that press? Or And here's yeah. the thing. This is what it comes down to. The bottom line is, can you afford to have this pest? Or can you afford to buy that extra piece of equipment? Yeah. And can you afford to not be an asshole? Those basically, are, well, <laughs> those are really hard questions. They um, are because they're yeah. very expensive to answer. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Let's, let's transition a little bit into just overall integrated pest management. And can you define what integrated pest management or IPM means from an entomological perspective? Yeah. So integrated pest management um, is is this highly integrative, as its name alludes to, um, approach to pest management. And so it's the use of many different um, tools that you have in your toolbox um, for addressing pests. And you have these ways of learning what's in your in your orchard or your vineyard or your hop yard. And you also have these tools that you can employ when you do have pests. And so integrated pest management is basically based on, I wanna reduce the inputs, which usually results in chemical inputs and, and financial inputs uh, into my cropping system. Um, and I learn from that every year. I take good notes. I'm a, I'm a farmer, so I'm also a scientist. <laughs> I have to make sure that I that I know what happened last year. We have that I, in common. We're farmers. There we go. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> and so, and part of that is learning from what you did last year and not making certain hey. mistakes and maybe repeating stuff that worked. Yeah. Um, every year is an experiment. A really, really big experiment that costs a lot of money. I was gonna say really expensive experiment. <laughs> Very like. expensive experiment. Hey, ex experiments are expensive too. Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So integrated pest management has all these different tools, and these are taxonomy. So correctly identifying what's in your orchard or your vineyard or your hop yard, um, because if you identify something as a pest and it's a beneficial insect, and you're going out there and doing something that inter interferes with this <gasps> awesome beneficial that you really want to show up, and then you kill it. Oh you my just God. shot yourself in the knee. Wait, does that happen a lot? Um, you know, it probably does happen more than we would wish because we yeah. hope that it never happens. But yeah, I've I've had um I've had certain people send me a photo of what's this pest, and it turns out to be a ladybug larva. Oh shit! Oops. <laughs> Luckily, they didn't You're do like anything. Home slice. Those yeah. are super helpful. Yeah. Like, <laughs> please release that back. Um, yeah. yeah. So so identifying what's in your orchard is highly important. You also look at trapping and monitoring so that you can identify how many. Uh, what the densities are. And so trapping usually involves um, setting up traps in a grid. Um, and again, if I'm a farmer, I don't have a lot of time. I want to minimize my risk. And, uh, and labor is a really big issue. And so making sure that you're using these tools efficiently um, can be pretty tricky. But anyway, so, um, and you also have uh, different tools in your toolbox. I'm trying to think of some others um, besides identification and trapping and monitoring. But, but anyways, you use these tools to um, determine when you need to employ these different um, management tactics. And those include biological control. What are you doing to encourage beneficial insects and natural enemies? Those are insects that eat the bad bugs. 
uh, to stay in your orchard or your vineyard, or I keep saying that, or your hop yard. Um, yeah. I'm just going to say your cropping system. There we go. Um, yes. There yeah. we go. Let's <laughs> save some words. Um, and so what are, what are you doing to promote that uh, so that when pests do reach a certain threshold, uh, maybe your natural enemies are keeping them at a, at a lower level? Right. Um, before I talk about the other pillars of IPM, um, the other part is that this is a threshold based system. So you're employing all of these other tactics to uh, mitigate the pest problem and keep that pest population down below the economic threshold. And that is basically when the pest. Oh, I love that economic, yeah, threshold. economic threshold. So this, this is, yeah. you, you already missed the boat. If you're at the economic threshold, the, the <laughs> pest density, the population has <laughs> already gotten into damaging levels where you are going to see uh, economic damage to your income. And so if you can go, um, so I'm thinking of a graph and I'm thinking of what the pest population is doing. And there's a threshold, an action threshold of, okay, it's time to do something. And there might be some other things that I do below that threshold. Um, and above that threshold, that's when we get into the economic injury level or the economic damage level. Um, and other things that you might do besides biological control include cultural control. These are things like sanitation, irrigation, highly important for phylloxera in particular, um, because again, soil type and, and water has a lot to do with what they're doing in the root system. Um, it can also have to do with pruning. If I'm thinking of powdery mildew in my grapes mm. and I prune appropriately, I might be able to add a little bit of sunlight uh, in yep. to, to dry that up. But what, but what am I sacrificing for that? I'm getting more um, sunburn more potentially. Exactly. More sunlight on my, on my fruit. So Alex kind of just glossed over that. Like it was a no thing. It's a huge thing. It's a huge <laughs> thing. So um, a lot of our job as winemakers or enologists, if you work at a small winery, you kind of fucking do everything. Right. <laughs> but um, oftentimes we'll walk the vineyards and ask ourselves, like, are we seeing powdery mildew? And if you are at the fog line or below the fog line, which is, a huge point of, you know, discussion in the wine industry, especially um, here. Yeah. Especially in the Santa Cruz fog. mountains where we're at with, cause we're right on the water. So we are on the, on the fog line. If you are below that fog line or at that fog line, you're going to have a really high humidity at certain points in the day, depending on the slope of your vines and how, you know, the valleys get fog up into your vineyards. Um, powdery mildew is a huge issue and you can go through and one easy way to tackle it is to handle the canopy and pull, um, pull leaves off and like thin your canopy a little bit, but you also have to thin your canopy in such a way that you actually protect the grapes because if you thin it too much and now this is why people commenting like, I want to be a farmer too. Part of being a farmer, mm -hmm. like if you think back to like, you know, the ye olde fashion days and you would see a bunch of people around a table talking about the weather for two weeks, it feels like it's because the, the weather is everything for you. So let's yeah. imagine you, you walk through your vineyard and you see powdery mildew, which kind of just looks like white spots sort of. Kind of. Um, and you you leaf pull because you're like, ah oh, shit, powdery mildew. Like that's gonna screw me over. I don't need any of that up in my up in my vineyard. But you look at the forecast and you see in, in a week or so you're gonna get a huge, huge heat wave. You may not want to thin as much because you're gonna sunburn your grapes. And and that's a really cool point of waiting. So that's another aspect of IPM. You are more tolerant of a little bit of damage mm -hmm. because you're waiting for having to actually do um, some sort of interference that costs you money. But if you see that forecast, that forecast could save you a lot of money. And so right. be, by being a little bit more tolerant of a little bit of insect um, insect population in there or a little bit of powdery mildew and keeping an idea or keeping in mind all of these different impact or different environmental factors because the, those uh, those weather patterns can also influence the population uh, building of, of different insects as well. Yeah. So I wanted to kind oh, of, sorry, oh. there, there are other pillars. There are other things that you can do for <laughs> pest management. Sorry. Um, so, okay. so you have cultural control, which is your, your pruning, your irrigation, sanitization. So removing, uh, maybe not dumping the pomace after you're done squishing your grapes um, uh, into the vineyard because that can attract certain pests. Uh, that's another part of it. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I'd like to add to biological control is uh, adding cover cropping or mm -hmm. other um, sort of diversity into that system to pull in good pollinators and all sorts of 
Um, we can talk about parasitoid wasps. So uh, those are another beneficial insect. Um, Wait, and, wasps and are beneficial? Yeah. So so wasps aren't so always cool assholes. I know. So the <laughs> ones that you're thinking of are the ones that I got stung three times in a grape vineyard uh, just two weeks ago. Three times in one day. Super fun. Um, the joys of being an entomologist. Uh, so there are some types of wasps that are actually that big. That's really tiny. Yeah. Super, super teeny tiny. It's like so, the size of a... P1000 tip. Or, or like a size 14 font period or even smaller. They can be very, very small. So these parasitoid wasps go out and they seek out aphids or, or whatever their pest in, or their uh, host insect is. They lay an egg on it and those eggs develop um, and then the larvae that come out, they feed on the insect, the insects die, the wasp emerges as an adult and goes and seeks out other pest insects. <laughs> Um, so biological control, Ooh. cultural control. We also have behavior. So many good control. questions, guys. This is rad. Sorry. Keep Ooh, them coming. Yeah, man. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then we also have, um, oh, what did I just say? Uh, behavioral control. And so with behavioral control, we can use aspects of the insect's behavior to interfere with its ability to be, pers to be pestiferous. So an example of that would be mating disruption with Lepidoptera or moths. Uh, so moths use um, certain pheromones to communicate with each other of like, hey, I'm a female, I'm ready to mate. And the male uses that pheromone signal to track where she is. If we release pheromones into the entire vineyard or orchard or whatever, um, you are basically playing a ton of radios all at once when that male wants to find the actual radio that's the real moth. And if you blast all of his senses with, oh my gosh, there's pheromone everywhere, he's probably not going to find the female. Oh my god, is it like axe spray? Totally. Oh my god. <laughs> like when you when he's oh gosh, I hate. Sorry if anybody wears. If, axe if spray. somebody is wearing I'm name sorry. a really expensive cologne that is actually really good. I don't know. Clones. I don't know any. Okay, know think any of clones. a really nice cologne, and there's this guy that's wearing it, and he's really cool, and this is like role reversal because the yeah. moths that are giving off pheromones are female. But anyways, yeah. if Tons of guys are wearing Axe spray. You're not going to find that one guy because your senses are overloaded and you can't find him. Yeah. That is an example that I have <laughs> never heard a professor say. And I'm probably going to have to talk to our ecology professor about that. You probably should. She will probably like it. Right. <laughs> Let's answer a couple of questions sure. really quick. So um, I wanted to remind people what we're, what we're discussing today. So because someone said it, what are we talking about? <laughs> so today we're discussing the role of integrated pest management and phylloxera in the wine industry. So we talked about phylloxera earlier, and now we're talking about integrated pest management um, because a huge part of winemaking is obviously getting grapes. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want them to get eaten before we can use them. <laughs> and you don't want to get them to eat before we get, yeah, exactly. So um, without pest management and without proper viticulture management, you literally don't have wine. And so today we're talking about bugs, basically. So Alex is an entomologist, a bug scientist, I am an enologist, a wine scientist, and we are combining our efforts to talk about bugs in vineyards and how to properly manage them and how they can both benefit and hinder you. That's what we'll be talking about today. So um, someone asked a wine question that I'm going to very quickly answer because this is like, this is more like a soapbox kind of question. So um, I'm sorry, Seb John 19. <laughs> Let me know your name so I don't actually call you by your handle because names are names are better, right? Asked, why does Napa Valley always get known for fantastic wine? Is it because of its location? Whether I've heard that upstate New York has better weather favorable for vineyards. So you can grow grapes pretty much in, in, a a lot lot of places, in a lot of places, in a lot of places. <laughs> um, so what's going to differ is the type of grapes you can grow there and the type of wine you're going to produce. So um, climates, soils, um, temperatures, pest accessibility, pressure. pest pressure, all of these things are going to contribute a unique area where wine can grow. So a bad place would be a place where you don't have a lot of sun um, you need a, at least like 150, 180 days of sun a year, more or less. Um, you don't want a ton of rainfall because then you're really prone to, to mildew and, other um, diseases. other diseases. Uh, you don't want it to get, uh, too terribly hot in the day. Cause then you're going to burn all of your crops and you're probably going to have very little water. Um, and you don't want it to be too cold all the time because your vines will stay in dormancy. And so you basically want an environment where you your vines can go into dormancy in the winter so they can like shut down and be like, I'm a chill. 
for five months and it's going to be kind of cold and I'm just going to do my thing for a while. And they don't get all worn out by the next season. And they don't get all worn out. Mm -hmm. You want a spring where you can actually have buds break and you want a growing season in the summer where you have enough sun to produce sugar and acid. It's kind of all you need, you know? And then there are things and there are certain nuances within that that can create different flavors and profiles. But to say that Napa Valley is better or worse than upstate New York, I think is inaccurate. It's they very, are different. It's very subjective. <laughs> it is very subjective. Um, and fantastic wines come from New York and they come from Washington and they come from Germany and they come from Australia and they come from all over the place. So um, great wines come everywhere. So I have the Ant-Man question. Yes, Can I answer that? Totally. So okay, Captain, it's actually kind of relevant. <laughs> yeah, so Captain Promoter asked, is Ant-Man beneficial? I don't know what the hell Ant-Man okay. is, but so also, Ant Ant Man's a Marvel um, superhero, but if oh, we're, really? we're just yeah. Oh, okay. But if we're just gonna break it down to just ants, because ants are insects, uh, ants can be beneficial, and they can also be s in some uh, in some instances. That's the other neat thing. Some of these insects will only be pests uh, in certain places. For example, quick example before I get to ants, uh, phylloxera is not really considered a pest in Washington State. Is it really? Um, yeah, because no. of the sandier, more draining soils. That's kind of cool. Um, and so it's not it's not really an issue as much um, as, as in other places. Um, it's again, it's about favorable conditions. I'm not saying that grape growers in Washington aren't concerned about grape phylloxera because they definitely are. It's on their radar. Um, cool. But when it comes to um, you know their, their biggest priorities is actually probably powdery mildew and yeah. spider mites. No, oh, sorry, I'm thinking about hops. Um, but <laughs> that's the other thing. I work in a lot of different cropping systems. Um, but back to ants. Uh, so ants can sometimes be sort of caught red handed in fruit damage. So that fruit damage might be caused by something else. Um, it's actually feeding on the fruit or maybe feeding on, um, on certain vines or other parts of the plant. And then ants get really excited about these tiny little areas that maybe have some sugar and they might not be the ones to actually cause that damage, but they will go in there. It's kind of like earwigs too. Earwigs tend to be thought of as pests, but for the most part, they're thigmotactic. That's a fun word. They like tight spaces. They like to crawl into these little cracks and crevices and, and find those for for their for their nests and things like that. And so when something feeds on fruit or feeds on a plant, sometimes it can create just the perfect storm for for those insects to come in there. Ants are also fascinating because they farm aphids. Um, Truth, good or bad, they they manage them. Yeah, they feed on the. I would argue the they're usually good, right? Uh, in, in most cases, in terms of an ecological sense, absolutely. Um, but the way that they can be a passive is if those aphid populations get so great because ants are in there farming them, that uh, the honeydew can become a problem. Um, okay. It can introduce. Um, different types of mold and other pathogens um, and create more of a susceptibility issue. In uh, Paris, for example, that mildew, or excuse me, that uh, honeydew will um, damage the fruit or make it really dirty and difficult to clean. Um, same could be said for grapes. You want clean grapes going through for yeah. uh, for your process. Totally. Um, yeah. So I mean, I did literally stomp on some with my feet like a week ago, but I had really clean feet. Fermentation's rad. Fermentation <laughs> takes care of that problem. <laughs> yeah, <it does>. um, <laughs> but yeah, so, is super rad. yeah. So ants, uh, again, it's this is all about uh, positives and negatives. Sometimes it's going to be a pest. Sometimes it's not. Um, in my opinion, uh, based on a lot of the experiences that I've had with ants and different crops, ants are beneficial. Um, they they will eat a lot of your pest insects. Um, they're not necessarily going to be selective they might eat some of your beneficials too um yeah i, I really like that question I, maybe it was kind of a joke but i took it seriously <laughs> <laughs> so one question that i really like because alex and i were talking about the questions before we do the interview believe it or not i actually do have like a legitimate like interview planned out here <laughs> i know that i'm like we stumped on some grapes but i really do have an outline um and one of the questions we were talking about was whether or not integrated pest management is federally or state regulated and i was honestly kind of shocked at the answer. So can you give yeah, insight into that? Yeah. So, so IPM isn't something like organic agriculture that has a um, certification attached to it. So you can be a conventional grower that, that uses um, non-OMRI uh, certified pesticides. So OMRI, um, yeah. it's the, or yeah. So OMRI is uh, what it, it's the, uh, the group that says whether or not an insecticide can be used uh, or excuse me, any type of pesticide can be used uh, for organic agriculture or if it's uh, confined to just conventional. And 
for the record, uh, conventional is just non-organic. Um, where was I going with this? <laughs> uh, federal estate regulation. Yeah. IPM. Yeah. So IPM, you can have an organic grower that follows integrated pest management. Um, and then you can also have a conventional grower who uses integrated pest management. Mm -hmm. Integrated just means that they're using some of these other tactics, um, like behavioral or biological control, um, or genetics. Genetics is another pillar. So is there a um, difference then between pest management and integrated pest management? Yeah. So I would say pest management would sort of be the old school way of how pests have been handled in the past, uh, which tends to be calendar sprays of insecticides. Uh, or other pesticides. Um, and there's, there are some other things that go into that too, in terms of maybe some integration, but uh, university extension, again, like the extension center that I did my PhD at, um, those have such tight uh, knit relationships with growers. Those growers are looking to their university extension personnel for uh, help with, with addressing new invasives, uh, pests that they've had for a long time. Um, and those integrated practices are really in a grower's best interest to use instead of getting caught in this vicious cycle of spraying because you can't overspray, cause resistance and have a lot of issues there. And again, that's expensive to do. And if you can reduce the numbers, of, the number of sprays that you have to apply, you're addressing uh, insecticide resistance and, and having a lot of other benefits um, from reducing that. So, um, so there's no tier of government that comes in and says you can only spray x yeah. amount of yeah well so there, there is that so you are limited in how much you can spray of a certain insecticide that is all defined on the label of different types of pesticides okay. so that is federally managed the part that's not federally or state um certified or um nobody's endorsing you to say oh you grow ipm you're an ipm grower um that's because it's such a dynamic system It'd be really difficult to police there's no perfect cookie cutter way of okay. i'm following an ipm plan because you need to be able to be resilient because sometimes you're going to do something and the pest is going to say that didn't work yeah <laughs> and so yeah. um there, there needs to be more tolerance for a little bit of damage there a little bit of wiggle room and a lot of um uh taking in information of what's going on in real time in your orchard or your vineyard yeah and not saying okay well it's october 1st i'm gonna come in with my post-harvest blah 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 totally that's um, such garbage dude well and that's the thing i mean again time risk yeah. labor and um for, yeah. i mean coming from you know a very um, I love the wine industry, right? <laughs> um, if you just, if you, if you're not monitoring your vineyard, you're yeah. just treating it without even like knowing you're affecting <laughs> the longevity of your vineyard. Yes. And you're going to lose a lot of, of your money. Vineyard. Yeah. You're going to be messing Stupid. with the ecology of the system. <laughs> yeah. So, so IPM is based on an, on an ecological perspective and looking at um, how you can promote your beneficial uh, insects and how you can mitigate those. It's about managing pests. We're not going to eradicate every bad insect from the orchard if you didn't have any bad bugs, what would your good bugs eat? <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you so you do need a, a small um, population of those insects to drive your beneficial insect population. Um, so someone just asked a question that I think is really fascinating, and I think that we have different perspectives on it. Um, and it's the question from Ali Kuhl. Oh, that's funny, like a molecule. That's an really cute. I love that. <laughs> Got it. Um, <laughs> asked, are people making genetically modified grapes? Nope. Nope. So, well, wait. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we have to we have to define genetically modified. No one's crispering grapes. Yeah. So that might be what you're asking. If not, please correct us. Um, but a lot of people are doing cross hybridizations. <laughs> so <laughs> that was cute. <laughs> I'm like, oh, not this nice hat rack, man. I got it. Um, yeah. So a lot of people are doing hybridizations. In fact, there's a really huge project going on in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, that's been spearheaded by Randall Graham. Yeah. The Bonnie Dune kind of, you know, classic Santa Cruz weirdo winemaker. He's doing a project called Popo Le Shum, where he is working on hybridizing varietals to be more drought resistant. And if you think that's genetically modifying, then yes. And that's traditional breeding, correct? That's traditional yeah. breeding. Yeah. So that's the thing. Traditional breeding where you're taking, I really like the aspects of this variety and I want to cross it with the aspects of this variety that I also really like and you're going through the actual pollination process with that, um, some people are going to call that genetically modifying because... Yeah, and I think we're getting to a, yeah. a topic here where he's like, CRISPR, sorry, Ollie Kuhl is saying CRISPR <laughs> isn't genetic modification. 
and we're, I think we're, yeah, we're getting into a lot of like politics. Of yeah, this, now this because is tricky. It is tricky. Nobody's really fully defined that. Um, exactly. Yeah, which is why guys, it's, in, it's yeah. in such arms in the media. You're going to say genetically modify, uh, modifying the genes of an outcoming product. Um, that's, that's maybe how I would define it based on my experience in it. Yeah. Um, Hi, Owen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, again, there are different interpretations of this. We haven't, as a society, really agreed on what GM True. necessarily is. Some Which people, makes it hard to answer your question. Yeah, some more. people don't even know what that stands for. Um, yeah, true. I think there's a Jimmy Kimmel episode about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I would argue no. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really think of traditional breeding as genetic modification. I don't know. Um, I, I can get into a whole role about that, but maybe we don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah, we're not. Yeah. But I do. I, that's sorry, a really great question. Olicule, I do love that question. That and is I love so your name. fantastic. I love your name. Yeah. Um, your handle's great. Um, and I that could actually be worth looking into for another enology episode. Oh, um, for sure. We, don't have, yeah. we just don't have time to touch it right now because <laughs> it's. It's so semantics and so society, but thank you so much for asking that question. Um, Captain Porter says, are you kidding? Please About what? elaborate. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, I mean, we're joking. We're really funny, but um, <laughs> please elaborate on that question. Yeah. Um, and this, I mean, maybe we, we literally have how many minutes left? We should have gotten to this earlier. Dang it. We have like four minutes left to discuss genetic <laughs> modification and definitions. Oh, 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 there's arguing within the thingy. Oh, okay. How can you say CRISPR um, isn't genetic modification? Yeah, maybe we throwing it down. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should have another podcast about that. Yeah, because that um, really is a fascinating area right now. So, to answer both of your questions, um, I think Alex described it really well. Genetic modification is anything that's going to affect the outcome of a gene um, that's going to express a phenotype. And so, um, CRISPR, you can change a gene that will express a phenotype. To me, that's genetic modification. Mm -hmm. We don't do that in grapes. Um, somebody might argue differently. Um, um, so all I kill to answer your question, no, people are not introducing traits that way. Mm -hmm. We're not doing CRISPR, but we are hybridizing to create. Um, <laughs> sorry, my computer just, or my phone was like, what's going on? <laughs> um, but we are introducing traits through traditional breeding. So this is a matter of definitions. But I do uh, still want to close up the podcast or podcast. Sorry, we're recording a live stream right now <laughs> um, with a couple of questions that I think are really interesting that we only have like four minutes for. <laughs> but um, Alex, so how do you see the future of IPM and vineyards and how can we make? Um, oh, Jesus. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> there we go. How can we make? Um, IPM sustainable within vineyards. Yeah, so so IPM is about sustainability. We want to be able to use all of these tools constantly. If certain insects develop resistance to some of these tools, we lose a tool, and that's not that's not good. So uh, there are constantly uh, new types of approaches uh, coming out from various entomologists throughout the country, or throughout the world. Um, IPM is is never going to go away. Um, the other neat thing about IPM is it can be applied to some new pests that we're starting to see. So we are facing um, climate change and a lot of globalization, which introduces the idea of these invasive insects. Uh, we're going to be seeing invasive species. We're, we're never not going to be seeing invasive species. Uh, yeah. We have a new um, invasive that um, it, currently it's only in Pennsylvania, but um, I'd almost bet money on it. I'm still in graduate student budget brain, so I wouldn't. But um, <laughs> yeah. seriously, uh, the spotted lanternfly, um, this is a new uh, pest that is being found in, in vineyards and specialty crops uh, or, or uh, uh, forests as well. It has a huge variety of different hosts that it can utilize. Uh, this is a devastating pest. We thought spotted wing drosophila was bad. We thought brown marmorated stink, bat, stink bug was bad. Great phylox, or excuse me, uh, spotted lanternfly, um, even though it's an absolutely beautiful, magnificent, <laughs> gorgeous looking insect, uh, that that could be a really a big game changer. Um, and IPM is going to have to um, come up with some additional ways to address this besides spraying, because while pesticides can be a tool in our toolbox, and, and I mean pesticides in terms of uh, organics, synthetics, biologicals. Biologicals are very important. Um, those are all very um, important tools to what we can use. Um, but that whole toolbox can be used in many different ways for many new invasive species that we see. 
Awesome. So that got really exciting really fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you have any questions or want to continue on the discussion, please feel free to um, go into the site community DM and Alex and I will answer any questions. Um, but for now, where can people find you if they want to learn more about oh, yeah. entomology so and what you do? You can find me on Instagram at, at trail running entomologist. Um, I usually post these uh, sort of weekly things about what experiments I'm looking at, little updates, little snippets to help you learn about different kinds of pests. I'm learning things new as well. I'm in plant pathology and, and weed yeah. science too. So uh, I'm learning about that aspect. And uh, I, I love sharing stuff about bugs because bugs are cool. Also, hashtag bugs are cool. Yeah, bugs are cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. This has been super awesome and really riveting and I love arguing it's like <laughs> uh, scientists man you guys are the best um I hope you can join us next week I actually have to change the layout a little bit because a thing called harvest is happening which means that I can no longer rely on winemakers to be able to come to me at a specific point in time because they they're like here <laughs> they're like sorry Keelan I got grapes coming in and they're more important than you and I'm like that's fine that's fine so um I will be doing the rest of the episodes for evening of enology throughout harvest because I know where I'll be. So next week, we're going we're gonna to be talking about chemosensory impacts of uh, structures in wine. So join me next week, but just me, myself, and I. Um, but for now, thank you for hanging out with us, and we had a great time. So we will, well, I will see you next week. <laughs> oh, it's done. Yep. <laughs> see ya.